wants us to rotate your phone. It says can't turn your phone on. Oh no, it's fine. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory be forever. Well, hello everybody, and welcome back to Coffee in the Cassock. Um, a big shout out to Neil. Thank you, Neil. Last time I saw Neil, he, uh, he gifted me this Michael's Gourmet Coffee. Uh, for our Saturday afternoon session. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Neil, for the generous offer of coffee. I think that's great. And uh, today we're going to talk about marital chastity, uh, as well as uh, address a question about spiritual communion. So uh, I'm going to give it a couple minutes just for people to make it out this way. Um, I'm not sure sort of how much of a delay there's always a bit of a delay but uh, I don't know what it's like out there for you guys today but here in Lloydminster it is just a yucky a yucky day weather wise so hopefully hopefully things get a little bit better I've been trying to get out for a walk every day and uh, I'm a little bit too afraid to venture out there today and it's really windy it's really yucky and the stores are psychotic the uh, the other ones up there Oh, sorry guys. So, Lyndon, Anastasia, Tyler says, hey, Hello. Laura Mercier. Hello. Wonderful. Okay, well, why don't we dive right into um, to marital chastity. Someone asked me this week to talk about marital chastity and what that means. What does it mean to be chaste in marriage? So there's a couple couple terms I think we've got to sort of work out before we uh, uh, before we. Sorry to interrupt. Sort of... I don't know if Father writes passwords to things. There you go. There you go. Thank you. So um, there's a couple terms we got to work out first. When we say the word chastity, we oftentimes think of um, celibacy, right? And those two things are different. Celibacy is perpetual continence. It's always abstaining from sex. But chastity is not. Chastity is the right use of, the, of, of our sexuality. That's what that's sort of all about. So oftentimes when you'll say something like marital chastity, people are saying, well, that's a contradiction in terms, right? Um, if you're married, then you're not celibate. And it's just because they're getting those two terms confused. So the way, the way a celibate priest or a monk lives out his chastity is through celibacy. So he does not enter into um, sexual relations. Um, and the way that an unmarried person uh, lives out their uh, oh, we're sideways. chastity is the same as well. Oh. It, it can't, like, yeah, we're sideways. You're sideways. You're like a talking sideways man. talking head. sideways man. Sorry, there's a, there's a, this is a new phone. How, can we like. A new camera. Does this uh, tripod? Yeah, we can do it. Yeah. Like That's this? There we, we go. There we go. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. Do you need a hand yeah, here? No, it's all right. I got it. You sit down so I can figure okay. out what people can did see. Did you break that? I did not break it. No, okay. it's okay. Good. And that tightens. Maybe I did break it. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry. Yeah, that's okay. Just buy another one. <laughs> Shush. Okay. Um, how would I take care of that? Do you want me to take care of that? No. Okay. Very no, good. I don't. Okay. I want you to Excellent. just. Excellent. All right. Be a happy priest. Yeah. Be a happy priest, I'm Father happy Mike. Priest. Okay. There you go. Well, um, where was I? So, um, chastity, yeah. So married, married chastity. Uh, how it works with, um, yeah, so a, a, a celibate, a, a, a monk or an unmarried priest, a celibate priest, is to be celibate. That's how they live out their chastity. That's how uh, an unmarried person, period, lives out their chastity. Now, within marriage, we are called to live out our chastity uh, through a number of other parameters, too. It's not just, yes, you get to have sex and that's that. 
Um, and well, as long as it's with you know your wife or their wife with her husband, then anything goes. That is not true. Uh, and so those it is possible to have uh, relations in marriage that aren't chaste. And so we'll, we'll, we're going to unpack that a little bit. So the first thing we have to understand is that chastity and celibacy are different things. And that chastity is for everyone, but celibacy is for those whom the Lord has gifted it to. The, the, uh, it's, it's a special vocation where you forego the image, you forego the um, sort of the shadow of this, of this um, union that we're meant to have with God. And we live that out as a radical witness in this world, um, or sorry, next world, in this world. That's what celibacy is. And it's a, it's a real beautiful gift for the church, you know. Some people, um, oftentimes, I've, in my experience, will, they'll talk about how great it is to have married clergy. And it absolutely is. Take it from a married priest. But they will also sort of say at the same time, I wish that the West would kind of get with that program because they've got... Um, you know, priestly celibacy, and but we've got our celibate priests too, and celibacy is a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful gift for the church. It's a beautiful gift that I think is oftentimes misunderstood, uh, misrepresented, and um, failed to, it, it's sort of not appreciated in many ways. And so um, I'm a big fan of that for those who it has been gifted to. And that's not it. So, uh, so those are sort of the, the difference in terms that we need to we need to understand before we um, before we continue. Okay, so within marriage, what does it look like? Within marriage, how is it that you live a chaste um, lifestyle? You know, how is it that you live chastity within marriage? And what it boils down to is using the gifts that God has given you your identity um, as a man or a woman along the lines that God has laid down for that. So the respect of the, of the marital act, what that's all about, and how that's lived out. So teaching of the church is very clear that the act itself has two meanings, the unitive and the procreative. So when a man and a woman come together in the marital act, uh, it has to be at the same time both a unitive act and an act that's open to procreation. Okay, so open to God's plan. It does not have to have a procreative intention every single time, but it can't be closed to life. Now, there that's a sticky point with some people. Some people say, well, if you don't really mean to have uh, children and you engage in that, then you're, you're basically just, you know, lying. Um, and it can be abused. You know, the natural method, and St. John Paul II talks about this, the natural method used simply and exclusively in a contraceptive fashion, you know, to always only never have kids, uh, is to use, he says, the natural, um, the natural method unnaturally. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not good. So natural, it's, it's a sticky point. It's natural. How natural is it to, you know, to, to space children, to sort of, uh, not engage in sexual activity at a certain time, whatever the case is. Um, natural in that way, is, I'm using that in a philosophical sense, and that is along the lines that that um, facilitate a natural thing. So, for example, or natural, a natural sort of propensity or a nat natural, um, oh, I'm missing a word that I'm looking for there, but a natural state of being. So eyeglasses, right? People will always use eyeglasses as the example, or maybe they'll use something else. But I've heard eyeglasses. You know, if you're against natural stuff, well then, you know, God gave us a brain. We can, we can make eyeglasses, and that's against nature. That's an unnatural thing because you don't see eyeglasses existing in nature, do you? And what you've done is you've um, used a tool, and God gave us our brains to be able to to be to, to be able to do that sort of thing. And so you're. You know, you're acting in a sort of an unnatural fashion by doing that. Why can't you act in an unnatural fashion within the marital act itself? And so I'm just using this as an example to flush out natural, what that means philosophically. Well, eyeglasses support a natural state of the human eye, which is to see. 
So they might be artificially made. They might be constructed by human beings. They might be technology. They might be a tool. But that doesn't mean that they're not natural in that understanding. Okay, so something like glasses helps a natural faculty. It aids in what God has already designed. Something like artificial birth control um, hinders a body's natural cycle. It, it emulates the natural body, cy body cycle, but it doesn't, it doesn't emulate it perfectly. So it sort of puts a woman into uh, a pseudo form of pregnancy. That's why um, her body changes at certain times and, and, and or doesn't change at certain times when it's supposed to. And so that's an unnatural uh, sort of thing. So that's, that's the way that term is used, natural. It's a bit different. Okay, so the unitive and the procreative. Those things have to be together in the marital act. Now, I don't want to just talk about acts. You know, people, people get sick and tired of that. They get, they get upset. Oftentimes, when you talk about acts like that, people will uh, accuse you of being a physicalist or a biologist. Bio, I'm not sure if it's a biologist, but uh, physicalism or biologism. Basically, taking a human action and exploding it into the entire moral debate. You know, obviously, there is more going on here than just biology. Obviously, there's more going on here than just simply a physical act. And that's important to understand in chastity, right? Chastity is a virtue. Chastity is a virtue. It is not just abstaining. So St. John Paul II, once again, talks about how Oftentimes, chastity is misunderstood, not because it's confused with celibacy, but it is seen as a big no. You know, no, I can't do this. No, I can't do that. No, I can't do this. No, I can't do that. And so he says instead that chastity is actually a yes from which a bunch of no's come out, or at least some no's come out. The no's that we say because of wanting to live in chastity have to do with protecting the dignity of our spouse, the, the dignity of our marriage, by treating the person that we married as a person and not as a thing. And so you've got to say no. You've got to say no. If you can't say no, your yes doesn't mean anything. And so that's what it turns into. We say no to certain things because we're actually saying yes to something even better. And we're protecting that yes with a bunch of no's. Let me try to put it this way. So, within the church, the way we grow in virtue is the same way we grow in any type of habit. It, uh, it's a habitual thing. Virtue is, is gained through habit. And how do we do that? We exercise it. We practice it. It takes effort and strength, right? And so within marriage, there are times of marital abstinence. There are times where a man and a, and a, and a wife don't come together in a sexual act because they are devoting that time to prayer or they are trying to responsibly space children at that time and they know that um, they've discerned as a couple that, that they time, and so they will not engage in those sexual relations. Now, you might sort of just decide, well, I'm going to throw that, you know, that caution to the wind or whatever the case is. I'm just going to use contraception and that's going to be that. I want to express my love, you know, for my wife, uh, even during those times or whatever the case is. And so the church will say, well, no. During those times, waiting together, as hard as it is, is an expression of love. In fact, it's not just an expression of, of love geared towards the other. It's also respect for God's plan within marriage, what the Lord has, has instilled in us and in the world as far as human persons coming together and procreating. Remember, there's a difference the way human beings do it and the way animals do it. Animals reproduce. Human beings procreate. Making another person is being part of God's plan directly. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. 
and it's something that the Lord gives us because of our personal nature, made in God's image and likeness. We can participate in that amazing creative act of God, of making other human beings. It's a beautiful thing. It's not reproduction. It's not the same as with animals. It's a different thing. We're persons. So an analogy, right? An analogy that I, that I like to use. Uh, our children were just watching recently a tour of the International Space Station. So NASA puts out these videos. They're, they're absolutely incredible. And so this, um, this, uh, this lady is sort of giving a tour of these different sort of components of the space station. It's really incredible. There's all these different sort of countries that have added on their modules onto this thing. But she talked a little bit about training before you go into space and how you have to train that way and why you have to train that way, as well as how you train in space. You see, space is a microgravity environment. So there's no up or down. When she was laying down in bed, you know, it looked to us like she was laying down, but she didn't experience it that way. Everything always feels like you're standing up. She said, I haven't sat down in four months or something crazy like that. Because you don't feel like you're sitting down. You've got to have gravity to sit down. Right? And so before they go into space, they have to train very hard. They gotta lift heavy weights. They gotta be in peak physical condition because their muscle mass and their bone density will deteriorate in space. They know that that's gonna happen. Because in order for your muscles and your bones to maintain their strength, they have to be under stress. They have to be uh, subjected to gravity. You have to be lifting weights, whether you're walking around or picking things up, or whatever the case is, for your body to maintain its strength. It's designed that way. Without gravity, we get weak, and we get um, fragile that way. And I would say that the same thing applies on a spiritual level with continence. Now, that's another word. We've got celibacy, we've got chastity, and now we've got continence. Continence, another way of saying continence self-control, delaying the sexual act during certain times. So delaying the sexual act during certain times is kind of like living within gravity. You, know? you are subjected to stress, psychological stress. You, know? um, you want to come together as a husband and wife, but you can't at that time. And so you struggle through that together, and it's through your common struggle, your common asceticism, like we say, discipline in the, in the East, right? It's that common marital asceticism that leads to marital chastity. The chastity is the decision to continue to strive together, as difficult as it is, and you come out of that stronger. In fact, they say that uh, the astronauts who showed us in space, the, um, the special workout equipment that they have, and guess what every single one of those machines has to have? Well, it has to have like a vacuum sealed um, system of pulling to emulate, you guessed it, gravity. If they don't have gravity, they gotta fake gravity because they've gotta have something to push off, of. have something to push off of or something to pull up. You're not, you're not doing anything. And so years of accepting a sexual act that doesn't have those two meanings of being unitive and procreative together can lead to a type of breakdown morally where we don't have the chastity required to just understand marriage as a whole, what it's all about, why it is that we're in. This leads to what St. John Paul II calls the culture of death. Right? The contraceptive mentality can lead to the culture of death. And there's all sorts of connections between sort of the breakdown of the family and, uh, and where we go from there with all these other bioethical issues, some of which I talked about last week. But that's the, way, that's the way you can sort of see it, okay? Growing in virtue in marriage, in marital chastity, that's what, uh, that requires confidence. 
you have to have the ability to delay it. If you can just have, you know, a pseudo version wherever you want, whenever you want, you get accustomed to that. And, uh, and that, that, that cheapens it, and it cheapens your relationship with the other. It depersonalizes uh, your, your husband or your wife that way. So that's the way we live, uh, we live marital chastity. So practical, some practical uh, stuff for that. Well, how do we sort of maintain that? Uh, natural family planning. Natural family planning is probably the most practical way of doing that. Uh, it is by far the, uh, it is the exclusive method talked about by the fathers of the church. Uh, there is sort of an understanding that the fathers didn't really engage in discussions about that because they didn't have the scientific knowledge. That's false. Um, you know, there was contraception back then too, and if they practiced it, so my fathers said that that's immoral. Um, there's, um, that's, they, they basically said, you know, you've got to wait. That's the way you, that's the way you live in chastity. But there's other, there's other things too, you know. Do you want to talk I, about some of the types of NFT? No, uh, I, I give that another session. I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not going to go into direct different types now, but that's a okay, good idea. There, there are more, it's not like just the rhythm method. There are types, there are styles. It is not all one thing, right? Mm -hmm. No, it's not all of them. It's not like... But the one thing that they all have in common is that they, they are all healthy. <laughs> well, they yeah. all take your, your body seriously. You know? One thing that, that contraception does is it disembodies people. It splits people. It gives an understanding that somehow you can demonstrate bodily love without your body. You know? that's, that's what it, it turns into. It, it's always a conditional acceptance and a conditional giving of yourself. I give myself fully to you, well, except for, you know, the fact that we might be parents together. I don't give that. I offer my, I receive everything from you, oh, except for your appropriate potential, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> very really tactful. I, I'm, really, I'm really happy to receive you, you know, ex, like the pleasure, but not, you know, the rest of it. Not the responsibility part. Well, you can't really have real love then. Right? It doesn't work that so way. Tyler wants, why is it that says groups, okay, probably some groups such as rad trads, for lack of a better word, are vehemently against NFP? Okay, that's a good question. Um, uh, my, under, my understanding, Tyler, and I'm not an expert in what the rad trads believe, um, but I think that they would take more of, a, of an understanding that Procreation is the primary end of the three goods of uh, marriage that are sort of received from the church from St. Augustine. St. Augustine is the one who sort of uh, defined that, came, came to those, that, those conclusions. And I think that some Christians, maybe the Rad Trads, uh, maybe not, I'd have to sort of hear it from them, but I know some Christians uh, will understand even the intention of not having, um, of avoiding pregnancy at a certain time uh, is already working contrary to what God wants. And so any type of planning where you would engage in the marital act at a time where you know you're not fertile, for example, would be um, a contradiction of what the Lord has in mind. And that's the way that they will interpret it. That is not the official teaching of the church that we have received. Uh, from the Mormon Vitae, which teaches that those two things have to be together. Um, but um, it's sort of a, a stricter interpretation of, the, of what the church teaches. That it, um, it's not contradictory to what the church teaches, because if you, if you um, are, are not planning that way, well, then you still are keeping that, that um, dignity and appropriate together. But um, you don't depart from that in the mind of the church by recourse to the natural method, which is a fancy way of saying natural family planning. So I, I think, Tyler, that that's probably what it is. That's my guess as far as what some, some Christians interpret as that as. It's a great question. Um, any other questions we got on there? Not so far. Uh, Laura. Laura? 
How can we as Catholics get NFP and methods taught in schools more than contraception, especially in biology class? Now that is the million dollar question, isn't it, Laura? I couldn't agree with you more. I think that this is the question that, uh, that is sort of first and foremost, you know, and it's something that has to start early, you know, charting um, the whole sacramental understanding of the human body, sort of the teleology, the, the, the ordered ends of marriage, what marriage is about, what sex means, all of those things need to start earlier. They need to be solid, and they need to be taught in the schools. They need to. So I don't know, I don't know how to answer that, Laura. It's a very good question. I know that there are some programs. There's a program called FEMM, F-E-M-M. They have their own app, but they're more than just an app. They're, they're a type of, of natural family planning, but they've done a lot of really good work in the schools. And I know that there are some schools in the United States that do use the FEM program in their health curriculum. So I think that a change like that has to come from the parents. The parents have to be mobilized. They have to go in. They have to talk to the administration. And they have to say, look, uh, this is a priority for us. This is something which is essential for our family. And it is something that, that is a non-negotiable for us. How do we how do we let this happen? And it might have to sort of work as a um, as sort of a side program to begin with. Like they might, be, depending on the school board, I don't know how this would work. But one possibility would be that if enough parents came together in that fashion and said this is what we want, uh, there might be sort of the ability to book a teacher at that time, and then you have sort of a parallel health program um, that sort of teaches that. Elective, like an option uh, class, or whatever the case is. But, but all I'm trying to say is, it has to start from the parents. The parents have to come in, and, and I don't want to say make a scene, but you know they got to do, they got to make their voices heard, and uh, and that's the only sort of way it's going to happen. I think. I don't think it's going to come from the top down, unfortunately. It's a good, very good question. Though. Any other questions? Nope. Yeah. Okay. So, to recap then, uh, there, uh, chastity is for everybody. Chastity is not celibacy. Chastity is for everyone. Uh, people live out their, their chastity. Uh, they, they, they live chastity in different contexts, whether you're married or lay or a monk or a, an ordained minister, like those, those things. Oh, another question. Different. And so, continence. Continence is the periodic abstinence of sexual relations. You know, within the Orthodox Church, um, it's very, it's, it's customary to fast from the marital act during fasting seasons. Um, some Orthodox will fast from, from it on Wednesdays and Fridays. Some of them will fast before the Eucharist. That's very typical, actually, on Saturday night. So, in that way, you know, it's not that they're saying sex is bad or the body is bad. They are delaying a good thing in order to say a greater yes to something even more good, right? which is the reception of the gifts. So that's that's an example you know, of, of how it's sort of lived out in the Orthodox world. Can you speak to the Latin position that says that priestly celibacy is an essential aspect of the holy mystery of, the, of holy orders, yeah. and that the Synod of Trullo normalized an error in pastoral economia? Regarding married clergy. Yes. Uh, I can Do you need me to read that again? A little bit of it. Um, no, I think I got it. So that is a, that is a very good question. Um, I would say now. So it, so the so the official position now uh, is that married clergy have there, there is dignity in married clergy. There is an idea out there, and sorry, and that. That, that is confirmed by our Eastern Code. You know, we, have, we, have, we have our own Eastern Code, which is parallel to this, the CIC, the, the Code of Canons of the, of the Western Church, the Canon Law. And yes. so, well, ours is the CC, the, 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 the Canons of Eastern Churches, Code of Canons of Eastern Churches. But, um, 
but the official line now okay, is that that there is there is dignity within Mary Priesthood. So I'll give a little brief overview of the history of this development. Good luck. Uh, with the little bit that I know, I don't know that much, but I, I know a little bit. So there, priestly celibacy is a discipline. It is not intrinsic to the sacrament like some people think. We the Catholic Church has married married priests. I heard actually that there are more formerly Anglican married priests who have now become Roman Catholic married priests than there are Eastern Catholic married priests in the United States. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised that if that, that, that is true. Um, it's a discipline. And it's a discipline that St. Augustine, once again, uh, insisted upon with his clergy in, in Hippo, when he was the, the archbishop there. And that's what this sort of this, this canon that we're talking about with Trullo is, is involved with. So he, in his jurisdiction as the bishop, did not allow his clergy to be married. And as the bishop of that area, that's completely within his rights and, and completely fine. Um, what wound up happening was that there was a, the Quintessect Council, Trullo, uh, that basically tried to be a corrective to that from the eastern sort of part of the church at the time, the eastern, the, the eastern part of the empire. And, uh, and so it affirmed you know, that, there, that there be uh, a married priesthood. So with, although there was a, a, a movement towards celibacy from the, from the Roman Catholics, uh, from the Roman, sorry, what will be called the Roman, but this is, this is all, all we're there was a, a movement of celibacy from the western part of the empire because mass was being celebrated every day. Daily mass was happening. Whereas in the, in the east, uh, it, was, it was more typical to have the divine liturgy on Sunday, one and Saturdays too, both on the weekends. But um, the, the whole point is, is that there were prescriptions as to remaining content, there's that word again, uh, during in preparation for the, the mysteries. You wouldn't engage in sexual relations with your wife if you were a married priest before reception of the gifts. And so you would you would um, abstain during that time. Well, you can't do that all week if you've got weekly divine liturgies or daily divine liturgies, right? So that, that was happening more in the West at the time. And so there was a movement to just have priestly celibacy. Now that being said, it didn't become sort of formalized as a discipline, still a discipline, in the West until the Gregorian reforms. So there, there was a tradition of married priests in both East and West for the first millennia, millennium of Christianity. Uh, and so it, it didn't disappear fully, even though there was a movement sort of moving that way long before. It was still sort of there and formalized until not until afterwards. Um, to sort of get back to your question about the the irregularity of Trullo, I don't know enough about that. That's a good that's a good question. Um, how if it was accepted or when it was accepted or how it was sort of fully accepted by the whole church. Um, I don't know when the Pope ratified it, but the Pope did ratify it. I'm just not sure what year that. Happened. So that's a that's a good that's a good question. So that's kind of a long long short story version of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, priestly celibacy in the church today remains a discipline, despite what you might hear from certain people who prefer a married a, a married clergy or prefer a celibate clergy. There are there are great arguments both for and against. Uh, but it is still it is still a discipline of the church. It is not inherent in the dignity of the priesthood or inherent in the ontological nature of the priesthood. Good question. Other questions? He said, thank you. Your answer is very informative. Okay, good. Father Mike exceeds is excellent at being informative. At muddying the waters. Yeah. <laughs> That's 
what we call an academic. Well, I'm not really. I'm, I'm working on my master's right now. But I am working on my master's in, on a related topic to this. So, um, this is kind of neat. I'm comparing theology of the bodies, East and West, and then how they uh, influence contraceptive use or the decision to contracept East and West. So it's um, I'm learning lots. It's fascinating. So, so um, other practical matters, you know, within living ch uh, chastely within marriage, I would say to prioritize prioritize your marriage. You know, that's essential, especially when you have kids. You know, you're tugging in a million different directions, um, and uh, it's very difficult to sort of maintain. Here comes a direction. The I can hear him. Yeah, here comes here comes a distraction. Um, to maintain the primacy of your marriage, you know, your your children come out of your marriage. Your priestly ministry as a married priest comes out of your marriage. Uh, your business work as the executive that you are, or whatever it is that you're doing, comes out of your marriage. That's the primary vocation uh, of a married person. And so you have to prioritize that. I, I was talking to, uh, uh, when I was doing marriage prep, uh, a, young, a young couple said, well, Father Mike, how is it that, you know, you can possibly have time for your spouse when um, you've got a million other things on the go. Like you've got your work responsibilities and you've got your social networks and you've got your uh, whatever the case is. You know, how, how can you possibly have time to, you know, to you know, have time for your, your spouse, right? And I told her that there's no, there's no shortcuts. You know, there's no magic bullet answers. There's no, um, you know, magic wand for that. You have to learn how to say the N word. You got to learn to say no. There's no other way. You have to say no to certain things in order to prioritize your marriage. And you might have to say no to good things. You know, it's not always bad stuff you got to say no. But if you don't learn to say no uh, to certain things, you can't say yes to a bigger yes to your wife right? or your husband. It's the same. It's the same concept that we talked about before with confidence. It applies in, in all fields of marriage. Marriage is about sacrifice. It's about candlesticks in Greek, self-emptying, pouring yourself out for the other, and uh, and that's in all facets, not just in the bedroom. Um, it's in it's in it's in the um, the day-to-day -day grind, and so that is especially the case with with when children come. So um, make time, have a date night, hire the babysitter. It's worth it. You know, make sure that it's 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 booked and that it, uh, uh, it's there and it's an expectation that you and your bride or you and your husband will go out on a date, spend the money, it's worth it, you know, it's worth it. It's much better to do that. Order the take, take out food. Or do the takeout food, but, but find a way to keep the kids occupied, you know. Um, try to make it so you, you're not interrupted. You've got to prioritize your relationship. The difficulty in many cases um, oh. is that what winds up happening is you wind up spending your time raising the kids. You are in a in a relationship where you raise kids together, then they move out, and all of a sudden you wake up next to a stranger, and uh, you you've lost those golden years of getting to know one another deeper and deeper, and and, uh, and you can't really get that back. You really got to struggle to get that afterwards. It's possible, but it's it's very difficult. So. Um, don't let that happen now. You know, make sure that you're that you're keeping your marriage front front and foremost. The best thing you can do for your kids is to have a strong marriage. You know, the classic example of the put the air mask on yourself first before you put it on all the babies. All the babies, because you got to. All right. Now, Kim is gonna say that she hears the hypocrite alarm going off and. That's okay. I didn't say because, that. Because I didn't that's say all right. That. I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm a hypocrite. I'll, I'll be honest. I struggle with this very much, and and, uh, and I'm gonna try try better. And that's that's the way it goes. But um, that's marriage. Other questions? No, but maybe give them a minute. Okay. And maybe I'll maybe I'll talk a bit about spiritual communion because someone also asked me about spiritual communion. It's on the wall. It's on the wall for the. For the uh, if you want to go back and take a look. Um, so, the, 
uh, the question is about fasting before spiritual communion. And I actually know the answer, so I have to email someone and ask about this. But, uh, you know, the fasting requirements and the graces received and the, the if, if, are there any pro, uh, prohibitions on how often you can receive spiritual communion? So, at the sort of at the back of this question, there might be a bit of a worrisome idea that spiritual communion can be an adequate substitute for the Eucharist. And I want to underscore right now, very blatantly, that it is not a substitute. Nothing can substitute for the Eucharist. Um, and I understand right now, at this time, it might be the best we can do. It might be the best we can receive. But don't let it become the norm. You know, I, I, I met with some people a couple days ago. We were talking about opening the church, and uh, one of them said that they're enjoying very much you know, the, the live stream broadcasts of, of church services. Um, that they would prefer, uh, you know, they can, or at least they can understand how some people might prefer not to bother coming back to the actual physical building and actually participating in church. And I'm, I'm terrified that that's going to happen. Because there's no, it's, it's not the same. You need to be able to participate, you know, in an integrated fashion, body, soul, present. It's a personal thing, you know, that we're that we're we're doing, and so we've got to be able to gather. And sacraments hinge on being able to gather, and we need to have that. We need to reclaim that. So, with spiritual communion, there are no actual prescriptions for fasting before, um, and there are no limits to how often you can sort of attend a digital. Mass uh, or divine liturgy and sort of receive spiritual communion that way. But I would say instead of focusing on those sort of questions, um, rekindle your hunger for the Eucharist. You know, rekindle your hunger for the Eucharist. And I think that we all have to do a very sort of uh, a very important thing as we come back, as our parishes are starting to slowly open again. And that is that to prepare ourselves to receive the Eucharist, you know, to, to, to try to get to confession before, if possible. Uh, try to do an examination of conscience. Try to prepare, you know, say prayer, there are prayers of preparation for the Eucharist, you know. Uh, say those prayers. Really examine your conscience. Really make a commitment to um, fully admitting to yourself the, the real presence of the Lord in the Eucharist, you know, and to, to maintain that hunger. You know, another, another example I could use, um, there is a girl, I forget how old she was when I heard about the, the CDC news, or whatever the case is, uh, this little girl, and she was sick with a very rare type of disease that basically didn't, like her body didn't recognize when it needed to be. She didn't have the, the physiological uh, whatever in her stomach to identify to her brain that she needed sustenance. So she was constantly passing out. And if her parents didn't keep a very detailed schedule of how much she needed to eat and when she needed to she wouldn't come to them and say, I'm hungry, because she didn't experience hunger. So it's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing. You know, it's a terrible disease and, and something that, that can really go unnoticed. And we don't want that to happen in the spiritual life. We have to be hungry. We always have to be hungry. Because that's, that's what saints are. Saints are people that are hungry for the Lord. And um, we can't get complacent you know, with this, and this coronavirus has given us sort of the magic ability to do what I'm doing right now, you know, and, uh, and there are good things that can come out of it. I'm happy you're here with me now, but uh, I'm hoping that, that, that the hunger, you know, to be in, in communion, at communion, will be stronger for you, you know, that you will return back realizing how much you've missed the Eucharist and, and how much you want Jesus. 
how you're willing to change, you know, to repent, that's that bad word, the R word, you know, uh, in order to receive him again, uh, and, and that that cycle will continue. You know? That's what the saints are. The saints are people that are continually repenting, continually trying to get closer and better, uh, and closer to the Lord. And so keep that hunger is, is all we got to say. But as far as worrying about how often you can receive spiritual communion or, or fasting for whatever, don't worry about that. Spend your time preparing for, for the real thing. Here's a question. Yeah. What is the significance of the fish picture on your wall? Mm. The fish picture. Well, the first thing it means is my wife likes to go and buy stuff without talking to me about it first. That's the first thing it means. <laughs> That's and not the entirely second, true. It's mostly true. And then the second thing is. <laughs> Um, it's there. Your wife appreciates yeah. artwork oh, more than you do. That's right. Yeah, that is true. That is true. There would be uh, no artwork. Uh, anyway, debatable. But um, but this is the fish that our Lord told Peter to to catch in order to pay the, the temple tax. Right. So um, he asks Peter, Peter, who pays who pays the tax? You know, uh, people in the household or strangers. And, uh, and of course, Peter says, well, obviously, it's the strangers that pay it. And Jesus says, well, just, just, to, uh, uh, just to sort of appease them so that there isn't a, a kerfuffle or a scene, go and, uh, and, and pull up the first fish you find, and, uh, and sure enough, there's the, there's the money in the mouth, right? So uh, it's a reminder for us that um, the Lord provides. You know, the Lord provides. The Lord in funny Lord. ways. In funny ways. In, in funny ways, in coffee on, on Saturdays, uh, the Lord provides. The Lord is good, and uh, and he, he never leaves us worried about, about those sorts of things. So it's a, it's a reminder to us, and it's a really unique paint. I thought it was beautiful and a good reminder it for me. It is beautiful and a great conversation starter, which is what we need. So ha, see? He likes it. Good, I like it too. I'm not, I'm not saying I don't like it. Other questions? How do we try? Okay, so Tyler says yeah. live stream liturgies have been helpful, but they are still a screen time. We have to be on guard not to be too comfortable with church on screen when there are too many distractions around these devices, like notifications, pop-ups, and how do we try to sanctify sanctify our living spaces during live stream liturgies without worrying about the technological distractions around us? Okay, now that's a great question, I'm going to answer it in two parts. I'm going to answer your first part first, then I'm going to expand your second part a bit with live stream lives. Make it as close to church as you can. Okay, so uh, put up an icon, or more than one icon. Burn candles in front of those icons. Uh, if you have incense at home, burn the incense. Sing along with the, with the strength. Stand during the during most of it. Cross yourself at the appropriate times. Do not dress up in your in your boxer shorts or your uh, PJs when you dress there. down. Yeah, don't dress down. Dress up. You know, emulate a Sunday worship as best as you can. Um, you know, don't chew gum or drink your coffee or whatever the case is. Um, I don't want to say pretend it's church because. The whole point is, is that you're supposed to be participating in that. It's not that you are being, um, you're not being a spectator. There is precedent for this, by the way. Uh, St. Charles Borromeo was the archbishop at the time of the plague, and he had public outside masses, because people couldn't, oh, he just shot me. Uh, I don't even know if this is a gun. Because people couldn't, I don't think it is a gun. I think it's a car of some sort. It looks like a drill bit. Um, people couldn't participate in, in the Mass because they would get sick. And so uh, <laughs> so they would, they would sort of watch. Oh, oh, okay. They would sort of watch. Maybe they, just kind of they would watch from, um, from outside, from a distance. Right? And that's kind of like what, what the live stream is supposed to emulate. Um, it's supposed to emulate that. So make sure that that's the case. Now, I will give my personal opinion, and some people 
might disagree with me, and, and that's fine, they can disagree with me. Um, I am against live streaming liturgies if you can go to church normally. Okay, so at this time, I understand it's a concession. Right? At this time, you have to have it. But um, in the future, when our churches are open, I'm not a fan of live streaming liturgies because I don't think it's actually an evangelistic thing. Now, this is coming from the man who has his musings with Father Mike channel, where I upload my homily every single week. I try to. Okay? Because I'm a big fan of live streaming homilies. I'm a big fan of having coffee with you and Cassie over live streaming. But I'm not a big fan of liturgical worship being live streamed. I've benefited very much from videos from St. Elias on YouTube. Uh, where I've gone and taken a look and seen how the how they serve or how they sing or the movements that they employ, the rubrics in order to learn as a priest. I think that there's some some um, some merit to that. But as far as sort of live streaming in order to um, you know, I think that something is lost. There. And if you look at the liturgies. Uh, the historical development of the liturgy. When you hear the doors, the doors, right? That's that's the deacon saying, make sure that everyone who's not a fully initiated Christian is out of here. Because they were allowed to stay for the readings, they were allowed to hear the teachings, uh, but they were preparing to receive the Eucharist. And so that mystery was protected by the church. Now, I understand. It's what Thomas Apple says, the toothpaste is out of the People know what goes on in a church, not like they did in the past. Right? So, um, but my point is, is that the liturgy was never really meant to be a means of evangelism. It was always the gathering of the converted. It was always the gathering of the people that were in the church. And I think that that is done away with um, with live stream yeah. liturgy. So what I hope personally out of this is that we will use as a church digital means much more frequently. I hope that, that we continue to send out our families. You know, we continue to have email connections. You know, I've started using Flocko, for example. I hope that all of those things continue, because we need to have more of a digital things like this. But I wouldn't continue with live stream as the norm. I think that a case could be used uh, in, like with shut-ins. You know, if there's a, a there's a particular church of the eparchy that has that special rule that will always sort of have its live stream going for, for people to benefit who are shut-in, who are who are in um, continuing care homes, for example. I think that, that that's legitimate. Um, what would be even more legitimate would be to have you know liturgy there on you know a regular schedule, uh, whatever the case is. So. So though, that's my thought on that, and that's a that's a good question. Some people might might disagree with that. That's fine. Any other uh, observations? Tony uh, about. Are there any other? Oh no. No. Oh, no. well, you're smirking. Someone said something. No, no one has said anything. No. Okay. I, I have another conversation. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let's see. The difficulties with digital media and television. My wife is just not at my beck and call at all times. <laughs> okay, well that's, I think that's that for this week. No, we started late. Give them one more minute okay, to ask one more more minute. questions. <laughs> one more minute. <laughs> yeah. My, our oldest daughter made this bean bag. She made this thing. It heats up. It heats up. It's like a, what are these things called? Like a. They're like a magic bags, like magic like bag. heat bags. Yeah, Miriam made that. I'm very impressed. It's just it's playing it around now. Good. 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 Right. Father says thanks. Ah, if there's anyone else, there's nine people watching. Wonderful. Okay. So they I'll, can say hey. I'll make a shameless plug for um, my new Facebook page. So. I'm trying to broaden the audience of our little coffee, coffee and classic sessions here, uh, as well as leadership for Musings with Father Mike, the YouTube channel. 
So I'm making a public page for my for my Facebook, so people who are can uh, can come in as well. So don't be surprised if I send you a an invite to um, sort of follow me as a public figure. All of this is new to me and new to Khan and Kim. It was we had a whole morning of like accidentally making three fake accounts that didn't work and then trying to delete them and then join them to the Instagram and then unjoin them to the Instagram. Just to join them. But I think that we do have it down now. So um, so well, the, the problem is we don't want your personal accounts right to be to be public. Well no, but we, we want we want we want people to be able to to benefit from this sort of thing and to engage in some yes. good conversations yes. and and, and we need to put some boundaries. We need to have, we need to have, yeah, public access. So that's why there's the other page. So, if you get an invite, please follow and uh, and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you already haven't. And um, I've been really enjoying these sessions. You know, it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. I, I intend to go back to the coffee shop part of the time and keep these going part of the time. But I'm always happy to receive whatever questions you have, and, and I'll do my best to to address them. Please come see more now. So, have a wonderful week for my Jesus Prayer 40 people who are watching and who are about to begin. I'm looking forward to our new prayer challenge uh, starting Monday. It's going to be a lot of fun. Have a wonderful week. God bless you. Bye-bye.